this to get into the Psalms. But I would encourage you to pick up your Bible if you can and just read a little bit each day. So um, when I went through Leviticus, which is towards the very front of the Old Testament, I was just fascinated by the whole sacrificial system. Uh, what God demanded as far as sacrifices are concerned. And there were four blood sacrifices that were listed in Leviticus. Were animals, bulls, sheep, goats, pigeons, and you're talking about hundreds <coughs> and thousands of them, <laughs> were butchered, burnt, eaten, and had their blood sprinkled on the altar for forgiveness, atonement, reconciliation, and redemption with the Lord. So I got this little picture that says, blood, guts, and fire. <laughs> the gospel according to Leviticus. Now we might laugh a little bit, but that's just the way it was back in the Old Testament. This was where it was at. I mean, the, uh, the temple was basically uh, an elaborate butcher shop. You think I'm kidding? I've worked in butcher shops, okay? Not where they actually slaughter the animals, but I've seen the, the results. But that's what the temple was. It was a fancy, elaborate butcher shop Upscale. where thousands and hundreds of animals were literally slaughtered in front of people's eyes. You know, the noise, the smell, the guts, the entrails, the blood. This was what it was all about. And so you had, uh, and this was all to appease this, uh, this God, to keep him happy. So you had basically four different sacrifices were called entirely burned, uh, a well-being sacrifice, a purification sacrifice, or a compensation sacrifice. And it was all kind of uh, based on what type of animal you brought to determine what type of sacrifice and what you were looking for in your relationship with the Lord. And the priest would do it a certain way and that way you were either in a well relationship with the Lord or you were purified or whatever. So that's Leviticus. So I moved, move on to the next slide there, please. So I moved on to Psalm 40. I'm in the Psalms now. I'm actually beyond Psalm 40. But what fascinated me about this are these words in <laughs> Psalm 40 where the psalmist says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. What? <laughs> what? <clears throat> but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. What? I mean, that goes against uh, Leviticus. Okay. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. And of course, we kind of put that towards Christ, you know. Okay, the next slide. And one of our lessons for today, fascinating enough, was this section of Hebrews, which is a, an epistle in the New Testament, towards the end of the New Testament, close to the book of Revelation, where the writer of Hebrews actually repeats some of the words of uh, Psalm 40 and applies it to Jesus himself. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. That's, that's repeating Psalm 40. But a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So again, it kind of explains it on the side there. Hebrews 5, 10, to, go again, yeah, stay there. Go back over, yeah. Sorry, sorry folks. 
He was ten five. It's a, it's a perfect sacrifice. So Christ starts to take place of all the Leviticus sacrifices. He's the one who takes his place. So then we don't have to sit here and have a butcher shop. Remember at the LCM, I talked about the fact that when we built this new sanctuary, that if we had built it according to the uh, Old Testament law, I would be using my butcher shop expertise, what little I have, and this whole sanctuary would be made for you to bring your, your pets, at least initially, because you have to sacrifice something. <laughs> You know, you'd be bringing all your animals. Remember, I talked about that one time. But we don't have to do that anymore, according to, to Hebrewism. Thank God. And then it says, burnt and sin offerings could not alone atone. So the Son will accomplish God's perfect will by using the body provided for Him. Christ became a man uh, to take care of the ineffective sacrificial system and replace it with a new one. He has once and for all... Um, annihilated or the Leviticus system of sacrifice. So that's that's the sacrifice that Christ made. And so we, we celebrate that sacrifice. And of course that's Jesus on the cross the bloody sacrifice. Okay, next slide. But around Christmas time, you know, we, we celebrate the bloody sacrifice around Easter and, and Holy Week. But nobody ever talks about the sacrifice the Heavenly Father made. <laughs> we think about that. Mm -hmm. That we should be celebrating around Christmas time. A heavenly sacrifice made in, through, and with the baby Jesus being born into this world in, through, and with a fleshy human body. I want you to understand the magnitude of the sacrifice this Heavenly Father, who we call the creator of the universe, has made for us that we need to give thanks for at Christmas time as a sacrificial act on his part. Now we're going to play a video if we want to turn the, uh, the lights off. I know it's kind of complicated. Jesus being what? True God and true man, isn't that right? He's fully human and fully divine. You have to keep that in mind. That's what we confess. And so when you see something like this, you, re you start to realize that this Heavenly Father that we call the Creator of the Universe is bigger than what we just saw here. Folks, it just blows your mind. Think about it. Trillions of galaxies, each with billions of stars, and our God is bigger than that. And it just fascinates me that this God of ours, this Creator of the Universe, would choose to take his cosmic uh, presence and cram it into a little baby. And how did he do that? And how painful that must have been for him to suddenly experience the limitations of a small little baby from his cosmic you know, dwelling. I, I just, I mean, think about that. And then, of course, what type of power did it take to create this universe? This unlimited power of our Creator, God, Heavenly Father, stuffed into the fragile body of, you know, of a, of a little baby. You know how fragile babies are. What a sacrifice. Would you be willing? We, we, get, we, 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 we complain when our shoes are too tight. Isn't that right? Can you imagine the, the, the kind of the, the pain that God must have felt in stuffing himself into this little body? It, I mean, isn't that true? Isn't that what we proclaim? And this universal knowledge, I mean, the immensity of knowledge that it took to create this universe and everything in it, downloaded into the tiny brain of a, of a baby. It, it, it's a wonder it didn't just explode. I mean, that's the baby Jesus that we talk about. That's what happened in Bethlehem. This heavenly creator of the universe, <coughs> from whoa, one little dot of light on this insignificant planet, the sacrifice that he made to come and be with us as we just casually 
oh, look, that's nice. You know, let's just celebrate it. But uh, it just fascinates me. If I was God, I would just gallivant the universe and say, hey, it's not worth coming down here. Isn't that right? I don't want to put these shoes that are too tight. Isn't that what we do? We just take them off? But God didn't choose to, to do that. And then we also talk about this uh, God being eternal. Isn't that right? He has no beginning and will never have an ending. That's what eternal means. He's never had a beginning and yet he's willing to experience a new birth. Whoa! Mm -hmm. he, he sent, in that sense, he had a beginning. He's willing to take that leap of faith <laughs> to come down here and experience a new beginning. And again, you know, it was not as though he was born into uh, you know, a, a sanitary, uh, ordered world. I mean, when you watch The, the Chosen mm -hmm. movie, you can see uh, Mary and uh, Joseph going into this dirty stable full of bugs and dirt and there was no, you know, nurses and doctors and like Dinah had, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, sanitizing and making sure everything's okay and they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, God took a tremendous risk and sacrifice and not only stuffing himself into this little body, fragile body, and living in this world for 33 years in this fragile body, but he took a risk in the sense of all the, the germs and bacteria and, and the, the political things that were going on that could have caused, caused his life to be taken. I mean, what a sacrifice. What a risk so that we can sit here and just casually say, oh, it's Christmas time. Yeah. And so that's the, the heavenly sacrifice I think we need to, to be aware of, in my opinion. So, again, how do we respond? Well, uh, according to Sarah Young, and I read all her devotional books, so you might want to look at them. Sarah Young, she's from Australia, called The Jesus Calling and Jesus Always, and one is written from God the Father's perspective, and the other one's written from the perspective of Jesus himself. She says there's basically three things God looks for in appreciating the heavenly sacrifice not only in coming in as a baby, but also the bloody sacrifice of Jesus. So you had a sacrifice by the Heavenly Father, you had a bloody sacrifice by Jesus. These are two tremendous sacrifices uh, that allow us to be the redeemed, atoned, reconciled, uh, a privileged uh, people uh, in, in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? We're very lucky to have that happen for us. But she says the first thing that God looks for is an attitude of gratitude. Just to be thankful for what he's done for us <laughs> and for the many blessings that we have. Just to have a daily attitude of gratitude and to stop the moaning, the complaining and oh my gosh, just to be thankful for what we have and what we've been blessed with that's what she says, because an attitude of gratitude puts God first and says, thank you, Lord, for everything that's happening in my life, good and bad. Just thank you for, for doing that for me. And then she says in her books, and this is all throughout her books, uh, the next thing that this attitude of gratitude usually leads towards is a trusting relationship in the Lord. Because if you give thanks, you're more likely to trust in this being that you give thanks to each and every day. Almost like a childlike trust of holding on to this uh, Father's hand in everything you say and do. And then she says that attitude of gratitude and childlike trust ought to be done in the present. She talks a lot about living in the present. <clears throat> We're so bound up with the past, which we cannot change, and we're so bound up with the future, which we can't really change, <laughs> that she says we fail to live in the present. If you want to be used by God in a good way, live in the present. That's the only place she says God can use you. He can't use you in the past. <laughs> Technically, he can't use you in the present until it's fulfilled. So she says, live in the present with an attitude of trust and thankfulness, and that's all God looks for 
in response to the tremendous sacrifices that she's made, that he's made. So, yeah, when you think about it, it's just amazing. And, you know, I remember a person who was on uh, his deathbed and yet giving thanks. Giving thanks. This is true. He said, Lord, and I, I'm not sure, he says, I am so thankful for all the years that I've lived. I would like to live more, but this body of mine is giving out. It has limited capacity. But Lord, I want to thank you for giving me this body that has done so much for me in all the years that I've existed. Think about it. Think about how, how much your body has done for you in all the years that you've existed. I mean, it's not perfect, but think about it. And he says, I just thank you, Lord, for all that, all for giving me this life and all the, this time and this body, uh, you know, that's giving thanks. And then, of course, you know, trusting. I mean, uh, all of us have gone through difficult times. And when you start to realize, uh, you know, what, what trusting is all about, it's just that ability to just trust uh, in God getting you through difficult times. And when you look back, you say, whoa, yeah, he pulled me through. And that's trusting. And of course, living in the present. For me, that's probably the most difficult thing, you know, with fears and doubts and regrets. I mean, we all live, <laughs> our mind is going, but just trying to be available in the present moment. Try it. Try to live each minute of every day in the present. And you'll start to see that you're probably living a much more fulfilling life in the here and now, and not being bogged down by things in the past and worries about the future. So those are the things that uh, Shashi talks about. When I think about having a sacrifice, I, it just, again, blows me away. Um, the confinement factor. I, I don't know how the incarnational process took place. To me, the incarnation uh, of, of God and Jesus, of, of the Heavenly Father, to me, that is probably the most fantastic, um, uh, un unexplainable situation or whatever you want to call it that, that has ever walked on the face of this earth. How was God able to do that and be confined in that human body for that many years? Um, I don't know about you, but I don't like confinement. <laughs> I get nervous when I'm on a plane for more than four hours. I don't know about you, but I don't. Okay. When I was talking to Jimmy, Jimmy who was in jail for four years, just four years, he, he said to me, Pastor Dawson, the worst thing about being in jail is the confinement. I'm in this little cell with this guy that I don't even know, who's my cellmate, and we're sharing this, you know, this little space, and I've that's my place for for all these years. I spend 95% of my time in this little space being confined. John McCain, when he was, um, you know John McCain was a, a, a prisoner in North Vietnam. I mean, God bless him, he rest his soul. But he said the worst thing about his situation was being in that small cage. They put him in cages. He said that was what drove him nuts, the confinement factor. And I would imagine that it probably drove our Heavenly Father nuts. I'm thinking, think about it. This is the first time our Heavenly Father experienced, uh, you know, confinement and irritation and, and all the knocks of being in this world. I mean, so that's, that's scary. And, and then being limited in your capacity. Um, some of you know Carl, who was at the Gathering North. Uh, you might have met him, but I used to pick up Carl every Sunday evening uh, in, my, in the cart from his nursing home, but he's confined to a wheelchair. Now, Carl is an extremely intelligent man. I mean, his brain is just like... The guy can speak five different languages. I've, I've seen him do it. 
But here he is in this nursing home, confined to a wheelchair, with this brain that has the capacity to do amazing things, but he's limited. He's limited to what he can do because of his confinement to a wheelchair. Again, the whole concept of being in those type of situations that we experience sometimes, um, our Heavenly Father experienced it to the max for you and I. And that's what we need to celebrate at Christmas time, is this heavenly sacrifice on behalf of our, of our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again for all that you've done for us, not only the bloody sacrifice on the cross, but your heavenly sacrifice in uh, the babe in Bethlehem. And we just know that uh, you did it all for us, and you uh, were willing to take all those risks on our behalf so that we can have a, a fantastic relationship with you and with each other. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.